Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What is up, folks? Yep, it's that time. An exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show is coming your way. Today's guest, ooh, so excited because uh, it's long overdue. Like many of our guests, you know, I've got a lot of friends in this music business, and we want to shine a light on them because they're doing some amazing things out there in the world. Jim, how you doing? I see that you're broadcasting from your red and black closet, your voiceover closet in Spring Hill, Tennessee. How are you, buddy? I'm doing well, and I see you're doing the same. Well, yeah, here we are in our closets. You've got man black case. foam on the walls like I do. We got a lot of black and red foam, man. Thank That's God right. for Oralex. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they love us. Jim, I got to say, man, I am really um, grateful for us just like double downing on this podcast thing. We were a little slow for about a year there when I was writing my book, and now we are back. And these conversations have been fantastic, and you've been on fire. Are you having a good time? I'm having a great time, man. You know, yeah, I am. It's, it's just, uh, you know, finding the joy in it and, and running with it. Not that well, I am, cool, but, you know. but I really appreciate you making the time for it because, I mean, it's like you have several of your own podcasts and then you're producing everyone else's podcasts. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, it's a, uh, I'm grateful for that. So, yes, you know, could be worse. It's an attitude of gratitude. Well, I am grateful to know today's guest, man. Uh, he is a celebrated multi-instrumentalist, educator, singer, songwriter. The guy plays every musical instrument with, I mean, with total conviction. Even the drums. I've seen him rock the drums. He's called Nashville home for the last seven years. It's our friend, Tyson Leslie. What's up, Tyson? <laughs> What's up? We're finally here. We're finally know, doing this. I'm We've so been talking about I, it for like five years. No, I would get it. I get a text from you like twice a year. When am I coming on the show? And and and, and it's it is happy. squeaky wheel. No, every no. The thing is, is you have to be your own um, salesperson. Like Jim will always say, you know, everybody needs a job in sales at least at once in their life. I always say that people need to either have a job in sales or need to, they need to be a waiter, so they right. know how difficult it is for those people to put a oh. living together and to <sighs> become a decent tipper, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it is. I mean, you promote yourself and you promote your events, and I can relate because we have a friend here in Nashville. That calls me the promosexual, and um, <laughs> you know, you know who he is. He's got a heavy I right do. foot. I do indeed. <laughs> you didn't even have to Why say that. I already knew those? exactly who you were talking about before the you pro- got that far. The, the promosexual. <laughs> well, man, you know, you, you you played with a lot of folks. I mean, you were a a. Like, we should probably just talk about how we met in a dank Kansas City seedy nightclub after one night i was playing with jason aldean i think we walked across the street and i wanted to see your band 90 minutes tell us about the scene in kansas city your background with that how we met that was an awesome night it was um and i you know i i started out just when i was in high school playing in original bands playing in clubs that wouldn't let me in until it was time to play because i wasn't old enough to be in there and they'd you play a place called the Lone Star, where all the cool bands, you know, everybody from Cinderella to Mr. Big to Green Day, like everybody played there. And I just remember, like, they only gave us five minutes to go in there and set up, play the gig. And then as soon as we were done, they were like, the guys were just hounding us, like, you got to get out of here. You're out. You got to go. So we couldn't even stay, like, for the headliners or anything like that because we weren't, you know, of age. And so <clears throat> gigging back then and then uh, having friends sneak me in the back doors to watch their bands because I was, again, still wasn't old enough to be in there. And then eventually just doing it myself. And then uh, in 98, post-college and stuff, I ended up in a band called Simplexity. It's um, an all-black band. They were all twice my age and playing old school funk stuff from, you know, for eight years, just learning how to kind of the whole head on the swivel and how a band communicates with each other and stuff like that. And that's when I met my, who's still my best friend, Gogo Ray, drummer, oh, uh, who Ray. you know. Yes. And which I believe is the reason that you came in to see 90 Minutes in the first place. So basically, Gogo and I played funk music for, gosh, we did that for eight years. And then we were so tired of playing Brickhouse every night of our lives. And the band lineup had changed. And things are just not quite the same as it used to be. And I was playing a frat party in a, with the band called Pomeroy in, in Manhattan, Kansas. And this kid was up there with an acoustic guitar between songs playing all these like sister Hazel and tonic and matchbox 20 and all these nineties songs. And I was like, 
And these kids were losing their minds and they knew every single word to every song. So I called, I got home and I called Gogo and I said, I think I know how we can get out of playing Brick House every night of our lives. Let's start a 90s band. <laughs> yes. Because that seems to be where the age group is right now for the kids going to you know college and going to bars, like 21 to 25. What time era was this? This was 2006. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <clears throat> And so all these bands that are down on Broadway playing Lit and playing Pearl Jam and playing all the Nirvana and all that stuff, uh, we were doing all that stuff back in you know ten years ago or twelve, geez, more than that at this point. And um, it's it like was eighteen years successful. ago. Yeah, that's <laughs> crazy to think about. Yeah. Um, and so yeah i don't remember the scenario but you came in and it's hilarious to think about right now because i'm like oh you're, you're a country guy let's let's throw you on the one land you know one and like one of the three country songs that we did oh yeah you had me play friends, friends in low places. places which is the most boring song to play on the drums well you know not what, but, knowing you know but i didn't know who you were yet so or anything like yeah, that but tyson so I, man that that when, when it's just like you just got to be patient and then that build it Gin, 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 yeah. gin, gin. and then you just gotta sell that money beat number two boom back boom boom back boom. So it, it actually i like that kind of drumming and it was actually it was awesome and i remember the i remember now the jacket i was wearing and everything man i had a yeah like, and the second hand leather jacket from, from <laughs> and, and you Avenue. calling me going hey take that picture down that you took with our singer because my wife's mad at me right no i had a real <laughs> i had a jealous wife at the time yes it was, cindy was jealous anyways um I mean, sarah was hot don't get me wrong what up I, girl i understand oh my god that's really funny <laughs> Were you laugh there was a lot of laughing uh smiling good times. i think that's when we were still using t9 <laughs> texting you know the where you had the very well forever. yeah i mean flat you know flip phones flip yeah, phones yeah. the whole deal for sure absolutely well that was a fun <laughs> night and and you know just to brag we'll have to get gogo ray on the show because he's such a he's such a world-class drummer he can cover anything he plays with such utter conviction he's yeah. always working but he's like the best kept secret in the music business he really is he's like a shy underground cat that can i've been I remember, trying to keep him out from being a secret but sometimes that's harder that's easier said than done well i would say that he is would you say he's an introvert i would say he's an oh uh, yeah okay definitely. so but then he plays a very extroverted instrument you know what i mean Which is a, and he plays it with extroversion a lot you know he yeah. plays the hell out of those things yeah so. he does well that band billy goat you know from denton yeah. texas I got Absolutely. to see him at a place called Rick's Place that is totally burnt down now. But we would go out oh, there. We, yeah. we would after, you know, at night in Denton, Texas, you know, by day we were playing academic music. And at night we would go out and we'd kind of like cut our teeth and play the brick houses and things. And and that band Billy Goat was playing. And I got to see a bird's eye view of a younger Go-Go Ray just killing yeah. his pedal technique. was It still is. I'm like, what? I made him play hop for teacher one time with one foot because I just I knew he oh could do God. it. And he said, don't ever make me do that ever again. Oh, my God. So he, so he did it. The whole night. The whole one song. foot. He oh was God. like, I hate you. It's awesome, though. It was so fun. Oh, my God. There needs to be video of that. I no. This was I mean, this was man. This was oof. no, you know, before everybody had cameras. On, I mean, we didn't have, even have real good cameras on our phone. That was forever ago. <laughs> so, hey, you've got a big 5-0 coming up this year. Do you not? Yeah, good times. Is that going to be... Yeah, let's, let's is that going to be... That. Um, Is that going to be a rager? I mean, are you, you going to get, like, kegs? I, and, you know, I got to do... Well, I got to do something. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but um, I figured I'd... Because I'm only doing two rare hair shows this year, but I figure I got to do a birthday party of some kind. That's cool. I just don't know what it's going to be yet. So September I'm pretty good at throwing 7th. myself parties. <laughs> September 7th. I got to see what night of the week that is. But okay, count me in, dude, because I, I love that. I mean, because no one would ever know you're that age. You are a timeless individual. I mean, it's well, like, you know what I mean? No, you could pass for it's the Asian thing. I, mean, I, I know what that's like. <laughs> yeah, Jim's like, yeah, I get the same thing every day. Yeah, people. Yeah, it's like, I'm sorry, I'm not 25. I appreciate that, though. Yeah, that's same. <laughs> so I read a blog of yours, brother, and it was it was at on medium.com and i love that platform this is great that this is you took the time to do that but you basically outlined the the early course of your life operation yeah. baby lift a mass evacuation of children from south vietnam to the united states at the end of the war from april 3rd to 26 1975 and you were adopted by paul and donna leslie and your original name is uh, i want to don't want to butcher it lee van vin 
Yeah, yeah, you got Van it. Van Vin, which became Tyson Leslie, and you grew up on 19th Street in Greeley, Colorado, 1975 to 1988, and you even went back and visited the property, and the yeah. owners let you in. Tell that was us super about, fun. Tell us about this, man. I think you're a first for us, a guest, a guest with this story. Um, well, I mean, it is just exactly what I said. Um, I was very fortunate to have. I mean, parents. My parents were cool. They were. They weren't cool by the cool parent sense, but they were just good parents. They, yeah. they were, you know, whatever. There was, it was a good foundation to come up on. I feel like the person I am today, which is a you know, pretty decent human being for the most part, I would uh, say so, is thankful to them and that, and just the way that. I don't know. I have no complaints. And yeah. so uh, oftentimes I get, you know, do you ever want to go back to Vietnam or do you ever wonder about your real, your real parents or whatever? And that's never been a thing for me until a few years back, a friend of mine went to Vietnam, uh, a radio DJ out of Kansas City named Johnny Dare. He went there. He always goes to like some uh, exotic location for the holidays, it's Christmas to New Year's. And one year he went to Vietnam. Wow. This was right before I moved here. And I said, dude, and he was p posting pictures. <clears throat> I was like, I never really was interested or cared about going to Vietnam and checking that out until I saw all this stuff that you just posted. Now I want to go. I want to see what it's, you know, like. Um, so it's it's kind of a matter of time and afford being able to afford to go. It, yeah. Now I'm intrigued, but not for the reasons of like <clears throat> trying to hunt back my own history or anything. I just I'm curious to check it out. Um, I, I went to Singapore this year uh, playing for the troops doing doing piano shows there. And so it wasn't far. I was like, I could, I could almost see Vietnam. It's like right over there on the other side of the ocean here where we're at. But um, it, I, I kind of felt like I had a bit of a sense of just how culturally different things are over there as they are here. Yeah. But um, I don't know. Maybe one day I'll get over there and actually be able to check it out. But they weren't. And it's funny because neither of my parents were musical at all. But my dad had this like little toy organ thing and i would sitting around you know picking out melodies and stuff on on this organ i mean even if it just whatever it is so, you know like i don't remember what what it was but my mom caught wind that okay he's got an ear for music and there's a lady that lived up the street that gave lessons so i took lessons from her um for a while and then ended up moving to Kansas City in 88 and taking lessons at the conservatory there. And um, that's kind of, but when I was you know, in Colorado, I remember I, I, I entered a talent contest. My parents entered a talent contest and I took the money from that contest that I won, uh, which is a hundred bucks and bought my first guitar, which is sitting over there in the guitar rack. I love that <laughs> you still have it because many of us get rid of our first instruments and we hate ourselves for it. Yeah, no, I, I'm like I'll keep that thing as long as I can. And, you know, I've even played it. I played it on Broadway a couple of times. You know, it's just I'll, I'll take it out and play it once in a while. It was like a Fender Squire type thing, or no? It's 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 like a Gibson SG copy, but it's like some company nobody's ever heard of called Orpheum. That you know, it was it was a hundred dollars at a pawn shop that my dad took me in and, and bought it, and um, yeah, it still plays great. It still sounds great. So well, they've got it. They, they had to be proud of you. Do, do you still have your folks? You still have uh, no, they both passed in the last year. So, oh, uh, you know, it's just uh, my my mom had it's weird because my mom had lost her mind and my dad lost his body. So, was, you know, dad was just like, it, it, you know, it was, it was at the point where it'd take him 10 minutes to get from the bathroom or to the couch to the bathroom. It was just he couldn't, you know, hang. And my mom had the Alzheimer's and dementia and all that stuff. And mm -hmm. so they both went within a year of each other last year. And um, so that, yeah, that was, uh, that was interesting. Uh, I'm so sorry, man, but they, they had to be proud of the fact that you went to a major music metropolis and, and infiltrated. Yeah, the yeah they were they were really def definitely um, proud of everything. I mean, and then they were always supportive, even back when most parents aren't supportive, when you're in that startup phase and they're like, I ah, can't you get a real job and go to college. Well, I went to college. I sucked at it, and I was just like, "Yeah, now I'm already playing in clubs every night, like you know, with this band making a living. So I don't need to really do this anymore." This what was the college thing. suckiness? What was that? Was it like a year or two? Uh, I was <laughs> I was there for like three and a half years, just at the Johnson County Community College, trying to get my stupid uh, associate's degree, and I just 
I was gigging and I was falling asleep in class because I'd be out until three in the morning. Then I'd come and try to be in class at nine o'clock and fall asleep. And just, finally, I just stopped going. It's like, this is dumb. I'm wasting my time. I already know what I'm going to do. Yep. Um, what I want to do. And I'm already working and making a living at this. It's not a great living. When I started in Simplexity, I was making $40 a gig. Yeah. And then we'd do a private gig and we got 100 bucks, and that was Ooh, a big deal. That was a deal. big one. Yeah. That was a big deal. Dude, I remember <laughs> when we played the, the Nashville Predators house band. It was 100 bucks, a chance to be on ESPN, and a hot meal. And we <laughs> loved it. I mean, That's I was in the right. Tin Roof house band. We ate for free. We drank for free and it was who knows what it paid but it was just like of course i'm gonna do this you know what i mean yeah. it's like these are our little rite of passage things that we do the thing that really impresses me the most about you is first of all you could just tell that you're a lover of music as a fan of music almost like not Thank as a musician much. but you are a just a fan and of a lot of different kinds of music and the fact that you can play keys and guitar so convincingly, not only as a as a rhythm accompanist or to accompany yourself as a singer songwriter, um, mm -hmm. but you can also shred on those instruments. You know what I mean? And all sorts of styles. And that's a really rare thing. I mean, Jim's brother is a um, working keyboard player, but he doesn't pick up a guitar and shred like Tyson does. He buddy, he is. Uh, he's always toyed around with the guitar, and recently. Because he's in a journey tribute band for nice. Stone in Love. I think he picks up the guitar much like Jonathan Cain did. <laughs> uh, but that's about the extent of it. But right. I mean, the, the fact that you can do the dueling pianos gig, which is sometimes people are like, ooh, you know, I've got a friend. You might know him if you're involved with that organization, the Howl of the Moons. I know there's that's a chain. Right. My good friend Steve Dakin has been in that yep. scene. Uh, for Steve t texted me this morning and asked me if I was available for a gig next oh. month, and I can't do it because I'm on a cruise ship. But we, Steve, Steve and I have talked about you. In fact, when I went to Singapore, I went with Steve. Oh, my God. Okay, so Steve is also another person that has the biggest heart, one of the kindest guys, will do anything for you, totally you is what you see is what you get and he yeah. shreds on the drums and he shreds on the piano and he could sing any song and but when i met him when i was <laughs> playing with kurt allison and his dad's band right, he was right, playing yeah. the high blow your lips off maynard ferguson lead trumpet stuff nice you know that what part I, mean? I, I don't know about that about oh him, he's actually. a killer screaming trumpet player like that nice so we played in the blues other brothers so you're doing all the stacks and all <laughs> the motown cool. and all that stuff and you did everything at warp speed so like dun -ash, dun -ash, dun -ash, dun -ash. right fast you know and uh so anyway small world i figured you would know uh steve but you could walk into the club and Steve will be singing from behind the drums while the other guy's playing piano or they're both playing piano and they're dueling and they're doing Bon Jovi or they're doing Billy Joel. I mean, you got to basically know the American songbook from the last 100 years or be able to fake it. I mean, that's a skill set. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely there's a lot of times I'll get something on the piano and fight. You know, there's 20 or more on that request and I don't know it. While Steve's playing a song, I'm throwing my headphones on. I'm listening to it, right? You know, and sometimes, sometimes too, it's fun to just learn a song in front of everybody. I'm like, okay, guys, I've never heard this song before in my life. I'm putting on headphones. You're going to watch me learn this song right now for you. And I'll get through, like, and I'll listen to it and kind of play along with it and then get through a verse chorus. I'm like, okay, I got enough of it. I think I can get through it. I might mess up the bridge or just skip it, but. I think we'll be okay and then we'll play through it and then usually you know i've never had anybody go okay that was terrible give me my money back let's put it that way <laughs> they probably think they'd probably love to see the the process you know, yeah it's the you're you're yeah. the, the man behind the curtain there the at the end of the wizard of oz yeah it's it's pretty fun to, to do that I, and I, I love the dueling pianos part is fun is because it's not the same any any it's never the same from day to day that's a rough, um, that's a tough gig I mean, even if it's the same venue, the gig yeah. all night, you know, I might play Morgan Wallen all, one day and then Christopher Cross like the next, you know, and then, oh, okay, I guess I'm doing Sir Mix a lot now, you know, it's just like it, it you just don't ever know what's going to come up. Dude, that sounds exciting. It sounds to me like almost like a like a like a stand up comedian that's in a different market every day. He's got to do crowd work and he's got to feed right. the crowd and you got to handle hecklers. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, very you, much so. Oh, dude. And um but you know like part of it is also just 
I, I, like you had mentioned uh, being a fan of music, um, one of the, the biggest advantages that I have in that job and one of the my main jobs in that job is being the cleanup guy. I'm the guy that plays all the requests that the other team members don't know. And I always have been that guy. And I like being that guy. Like I'm, I'm like, wait, uh, man in motion. Yeah, I got that. I can do that. You know, or whatever it is like, okay, I haven't heard that song in like, or haven't played this song ever in my life. Or if I'd have, it's been like 20 years, but let's give it a shot. And that's fun because this the challenge of it. Yeah. And it's great. Also, when you're on Broadway and you're playing with a group of guys that are around our age, <laughs> that's very important, by the way, uh, in order to pull, do the same thing on Broadway. You can do it a lot. You know, like we've, we had, uh, I, I play with Chelsea Foster on Sundays with a guy named Jeff Duke on guitar and, and, uh, and, and, and Steve, the drummer, all of us are around the same age. And so do I, do I know Steve? Is it Steve Cummings? Uh, 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 Steve Wilson. Steve Wilson. Oh, yeah. No, Steve Wilson from the... Uh, Incredible. Yeah. Incredible from, uh, from L.A. I crashed yeah. on his uh, couch many times. Yeah, he's playing with the Dead Kennedys now, which is hilarious. It's Good for trip. him. He's <laughs> keeping the American punk song yeah, alive. Right. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, when I have guys like that, I, they're, they're Swiss Army knives. I can play anything I want, and they're most likely going to know it or be able to get really close and get it's, through it. You're talking about something that I'm familiar with. It's like... All the stuff that I would shed it on my youth, yes. I can pretty much recall and play. Yeah, it's gonna be rough, but but I that's why it doesn't work for people who are twenty two, right? Because they weren't alive or even a thought when those songs came out. And that's an interesting thing that we've been talking about a lot and uh, about Broadway stuff is that age gap and that you know you have to consider all this music that the three of us know we know because we grew up on it. They did not. Yeah, this I guess, is all yeah. hard, 100% learning from scratch, sweet child of mine, and living on a prayer, and all of the standards, they don't, they didn't grow up on that stuff, that's, so it's that's not really scary. just locked into your mind like it is for us, because we've heard it a million times, and we watched the videos on MTV and heard the radio, you know, whatever. They didn't have that luxury, it's unless like, their parents were just listening to it all the time. It's part of our fiber. Of it is beings at this point, you know, and yeah. it's not part of theirs at all, which is why a lot of times when you go down on Broadway and you see a lot of bands that are in that age group, it's like, okay, that sounds pretty close, I guess, but yeah, and that's uh, that's a swing and a miss. Um, yeah, it, you know, if you call on the band stage, you're, you're like, hey man, you know, bad company can't get enough of your love, and you're, it's a shuffle, it's a rock shuffle, and they're like, ooh, uh, right. you know what I mean? It's like, like what. <laughs> You can't right. get enough. You what? You don't know. I mean, shit. But it, it goes. It's funny because it goes that way for professional musicians too. Like I did this. I was in this gig in Florida last year, and George Lynch gets up to play "Highway to Hell," and that dude couldn't play "Highway to Hell" to save his life. It wow. was so funny. And the and the more I thought about it, I was like, you know, because you think about that song as one of the most standard bar songs in the world. You know every bar band plays that stupid. but george lynch has been playing in bars he's been right he's been he's been playing his own music his whole life so why yes. would he know that song you know that was so that was an interesting take from a different perspective on the exact same subject. well now guys, yeah what are your thoughts on the um you know sammy hagar is kind of getting i guess doing a van halen tribute and going out on tour this summer yeah and with uh bonham jason bonham on drums sat Sirianni on guitar Michael Anthony on the bass, and of course, Sammy uh, heading up lead vocals. Yeah. Uh, with rumored that, you know, DLR actually may come along and sing some of the old classics. Um, recently on the Howard Stern show, apparently uh, Satriani admitted that, like, some of the stuff that Eddie did, I can't, I got to work on. You know? Yeah, sure. One of that them means. was beginning to Mean Streets. Yep. And a lot of debate has kind of gone around of, well, is he the right guy to be doing this? And it's like, you know, Satriani is a legend at being Satriani, you know, right. what I mean? and the stuff that he's done. But when it when you got to do stuff that Eddie did, yeah, that's right. a, that's a whole different genre. Who do you call? Who is the closest thing to Eddie, to Eddie? in a modern era? You know, there um, are guys like hobbyists there out there, Instagram yeah. guys that are, probably can pull it off because they they've just modeled Eddie their entire life. But some of the Instagram right. guys might be like weird savants that have to have cereal three times a day and don't you know what I mean? That they, <laughs> they, they don't shower or there's some sort of a thing, right? 
they, they, yeah. can't, they don't play well with others. But no, who's like a modern guy, Tyson, that would that come so close to that? Like, because you're always on the rock. Like a modern, well known guy? Yeah. Well, because I mean, that's the thing. Well known. You know, Nuno. the. Who? Yeah, but I mean, yeah, I mean, Nuno's probably. Would, Nuno. uh, yeah. That Nuno. Good, I mean, uh, and even Joe, like, I think Joe just didn't have enough time to work all that stuff up because they literally had just gotten together before that Stern show. Like, that, they didn't have a lot of time to, they hadn't really rehearsed stuff up yet, much yet. Yeah. And um, I also got to give a shout out to Third Power Amplification from here in Nashville who just landed the, uh, the Satriani deal for this tour. Right. So that's pretty cool in itself. But I think it's going to be cool. And that, and that was the whole thing with Joey. He's like, I wanted to figure out a way where I can still sound like me, but also sound like Eddie. And they got in touch with Delana from Third Power, and they've been working together to try to achieve that exact thing and that sound. I think it's going to be really cool. I, I don't, you know, it's this stuff is weird. Like the Pantera thing is weird. The Van Halen thing is weird. It's like, let's go see van halen without van halen let's go see panther like it that as a, a fan it is bizarre but i'm not gonna not give it a shot uh, i mean right. especially since in both camps i have friends <laughs> in them so i'm like uh, you know charlie Bonate is a buddy of mine which never in a million years would i've ever thought that was going to be a thing in my life but we saw uh, you at the anthrax show jim and i were having a, a mandate to oh, two yeah. dudes on the town at the Rhyme. Yeah, i mean they're you. one of my all-time favorite bands and yeah. now i'm friends with like all of them except for the new guitar player i don't know him but i know all the other guys and that like, is uh, bizarre to me you but, read what you show well, it's not it's not it's not weird to me because you are in the game and you are checking all the boxes, man, and you never quit. And every day you're just trying to move that ball down the field, whether you got a guitar in your hand or a keyboard, but you're singing. You're just not That's afraid what you to gotta work. Do. I didn't come here to me I didn't come here to mess around. I you know like yeah. people are like why didn't you teach him? Why didn't well, cuz I don't want to do the exact same thing I was doing in Kansas City. Like what's the yeah. point? Otherwise why bother? Like this year I'm concentrating on less Broadway and more writing, recording, getting into that world more because when I first got here I had kind of struggled with that and I didn't like the music that I was hearing that were in these writers rounds and stuff like that. But then it took a guy like Marty Fredrickson and some of these other guys to tell me like, well, stop, don't waste your time over here trying to fit it into this mold that it doesn't, that's not you, you know, you're not going to write songs about trucks and Daisy Dukes and all that kind of nonsense. I, I can't do it. That's not my wheelhouse. I'm yeah. way more Ryan Adams than I am Jason Aldean, you know, or whatever. Oh, dude, I tried for four years to write songs about Daisy Dukes and it was a struggle every day. <laughs> I, I can't do it. So I, uh, he just said, you know, start writing for, for the people you want to write with and with the people you want to <laughs> write with. And now I'm working on music with David Ellison from Megadeth and uh, Jason McMaster from Dangerous Toys. We're doing a country project together. And, Great. And Corey Glover from Living Color wants to do an R&B record. Like, this is insane. So, like, all of these things are happening. Plus, I'm writing just stuff for myself. And uh, so less Broadway, more being creative, writing, recording, and putting stuff out there that's going to have a little more longevity than just playing Jesse's Girl down on Broadway. for Dude, I tours. celebrate that. And you never know if the people are going to honor the little two-four measures and the little five-bar phrases, <laughs> the little quirky <laughs> things that make those songs. You're like, ah, no, you don't really know it. Um, <laughs> I think that's, man, I applaud this. I mean, that's a really that that's a really great plan. Now, for the longest while, and you might still be doing it, you were playing with Vixen. Yep, I'm um, going out with them this weekend. And so that is that is that got to be? Are you the only guy? That's got to be. Fun. I am. It is fun. <laughs> and so you, yeah, do you no you complaints. Get, you get the female perspective because I do in a lot of ways. I mean, I definitely hear some very interesting conversations in the vans when we have long travel days. It's just like, well, I'm either gonna shut my ears off and just put my you know headphones on and not listen to this right now, or I just just listen in and quietly smile or sometimes you know depending on subject matter i'll chime in here and there but um oh but yeah they're they're super easy to work with i've been with them since 2017 and uh man we've been all over the world and played for you know with we we do so many gigs with all these people that used to hang on my wall as a kid and now they're all my friends and um some of them are like my friend friends and that's an interesting thing and you know how this that dynamic is both of you guys know it's that yeah. whole thing of being a fan to going from that to being a peer with somebody and then now you're friends with them and then you're really friends with them you're going to their house or you're having lunch together you know those types of things i mean i remember 
the first one of the first guys that I met here when I lived here was uh, Rachel Bolin from Skid Row. And I, and I did this cover project with him and his girlfriend at the time and went to rehearse at his house. And I'm just like, I almost pierced my nose because of you in eighth grade. And now I'm just like eating your barbecue and hanging out. But this is weird. I'm not going to lie, but it's pretty cool. <laughs> you know, and, um, like, without naming names. Uh, being friends with them, uh, do you ever have one that calls you and that makes you kind of go, "Oh gosh, what do they want?" Uh, no, actually, I don't they really have. Pretty cool. Everybody's been great. Um, I and the ones that I don't want to hear from, I don't hear from, which is fine. <laughs> so not like that. No, you get that one that's just I've, bombs on you. And they there were, is one guy uh, I'd have to admit that <laughs> like, really but annoying. <laughs> He he really hasn't hit me up very often, but I I do recall about three or four months ago my phone and I was like, what the, f what does this guy want? You know, so that's amazing. Well, I re I remember you said sharing a meme with me, and it was a picture of Vixen in like 1984, and it was like guys in the dressing room and bottles of whiskey, and that, then there was like Vixen in 2017, and it was every right, one of them on phones. their phone. <laughs> Totally. backstage on their phone <laughs> that's oh. a long time ago yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah amazing um so where what are some of your favorite places that because because i know you do the rock cruises and there's like big rock festivals you know a yeah. band like a band like vixen what are is is it theaters is it festivals what what are some of the fa yeah, favorite mostly, places that you like this weekend we'll be we're doing the arena at mohegan sun with which you were there last time i was there i think yeah um we're playing with uh, Stephen Piercy from Rat and oh, nice. uh, Quiet Riot and uh, the other version of LA Guns with a, has the now um, deceased Steve Riley, which is interesting how that's going to play out. But they're going to keep going apparently, uh, even under the Steve Riley's LA Guns. That's uh, that was their that was his wishes, and that's what they're going to do. So, um, and they're all sweet guys. They're all you know, uh, all those guys are, and all those bands are great. And in fact, Stephen Piercy was one of those guys I used to use uh, as an example of, of you know, a lot of times you get unpleasant people in that world. But, um, and he was oftentimes when I was younger and had run run-ins with him, he was not the nicest guy in the world. He was definitely, not, uh, I don't know. He was challenging to be around and, and to get to know. And then I don't know if it's his girlfriend or what's changed, but he's the sweetest guy ever now. Like I, every time I see him, in fact, I saw him in Vegas last month at the Eddie Trunk thing, and I didn't even see him first. He's just like he tapped me on the shoulder, like, "What are you doing here?" I was like, "Oh, hey." You know, so that that in itself is kind of surreal, but it's cool that it, I love seeing that progression. Um, George Lynch is another guy. I remember when I played with him for the first time uh, in one of his clinics. I remember telling him afterwards, saying. Man, I'm not gonna lie. I I really had a great time and I really enjoyed this. I heard that I'd heard nothing but negative things about like that you were kind of an asshole and and <laughs> you you really surprised me that you weren't. This has been so fun and he and one thing that he well, said that wait. that really stands out in my mind is he's like, man, uh, if you would have met me, uh, you know, at a certain, this point in my life, then yes, I, you probably would have met that person. And he's like, at this point. I'm just glad people still show up to hear my music. And I was like, that's pretty cool. I, I, I dig that. That perspective is how it should be for everybody in in these legacy acts. You know what I mean? That, that like is that. that is a great perspective. Um, so, wow, man. Um, I know that you uh, have created these rare hair events. And how many have there been now? Uh, we just did the 18th show in December. That's incredible. So is it two a year you're doing now? Uh, usually it's three last three. year we did four. Mm -hmm. Um, and this year we're only going to do two. Uh, I just needed to back off a little bit from all kinds of different things and, and reassess my life. <laughs> well, I, I plan, I applaud you for creating those things. Cause I have been a, an event creator and, uh, you know, yeah. I did four drummers weekends in Nashville. I did one in Los Angeles. It is so much work and you are so tied to the phone and you're texting and your emails and constant phone calls and time. voicemails for it, it would take about four months to organize one of those things. Yeah. And you have to have the relationship with the players and the backline people and the nightclub and all. So that is a lot of work. So I know that you're doing it because you love music and you love this community and you like shining a light on people. But I do hope you make a little money on those things. Um, the way that it works is. I, I I don't unless like 
I just pay myself back for expenses and stuff like that. Okay, so all right. when we, I, I, t- I honestly took the whole, you know, it, Tom Hurst, I, I always have to go back to that. Um, loud jams. And his loud jams because, you know, at the time I was playing with Tracy Lawrence with him for a second when I came up with the idea. And um, nice. we were on the bus together and I was just like, man, I had this idea for this band. Rare Hair was just supposed to be a band um, It was that played deep cut 80s hard rock um and from bands like dangerous toys and these bands that don't get a lot of you're not gonna hear anybody playing on broadway or anything like that yeah um and so i wanted after playing a few loud jams i figured this might be a better way to a better avenue for this show um and for this concept and so i remember asking uh tom about it and on the bus and he's you know yeah that sounds that would be cool and so we did our first one at Douglas Corner, and you were there. It was yeah. um, it was Monday, January eleventh, I believe, on twenty sixteen. Yes. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, and it's just now we're doing two shows on the Monsters of Rock cruise this year that are rare hair shows that are just rock stars in the show, and which is awesome. And then we do the two shows here in Nashville. Um, the first one's going to be April 16th, I think it's the history of heavy metal. So we're going to do all the, there's a lot of the older guys that, you know, they like to play the black Sabbath and the deep purple and stuff like that. And we've really not touched that world because the rock and roll residency, they have that kind of on lock and, uh, they're exceptionally great at it, but I wanted to give everybody else a chance to kind of, and some of the old rock star guys, that's what they want to play. They don't want to play the 80 stuff because they didn't grow up on it they didn't that was they were being rock stars during the same time right yeah. so they don't often gravitate towards oh i want to play that nelson song or i want to play that <laughs> you know they don't want to do that they want to play you know they want to play i don't know funk 49 or they want to play something that's that's classic rock and that's yeah kind of classic thing. rock classic so, rock yeah so that's um that's what we're going to do for the next one and then we're going to do an, the big one in december like we always do which i don't know what that's going to be the last the last one we did was the music of desmond child and ah yes very, and, and very i was cool. thank you for uh booking sarah my student sarah the real deal car deal she i heard yeah, she did yeah. well on her she did great uh, and, and i knew that was a whole thing where she just texted me or Tori texted me and said, Hey, we're coming to Ray Hair. I was like, Oh, well, why don't you just play? I if love you're it. coming, just Thank play. You. Like that's ridiculous. You yeah, should she be did. Playing. I was made for loving you. Kisses yeah, one she and great. only disco song. <laughs> yeah, she was awesome. Yeah, she's a sweetheart. I'll be seeing her this weekend at Mohegan Sun. So. Oh, she'll be there, man. That's a, that's what's great, is she lives so close and she goes and sees all the shows and she figures out a way to get backstage and talk to all the drummers. <laughs> she always does. And and that work, and it's amazing. Topic, man. I, I'd love to break. I'm like, how do you get on these? You know, who's asking for you to sit in? You know, is she doing it or is she got a van? She asks. She asks. Sarah oh, is oh, sitting fearless. In pants, yeah, she is. She, she's a promosexual <laughs> like me. And she is. <laughs> And Tyson. She's a salesperson, man. She's a total natural salesperson. Yeah. What do you got? What do you have to lose? Someone might say no. Right. Yeah. That's, that's it. it. That's all you but, got. I mean, do they know of her when they when she's coming up to ask them? Do you know? I, I would imagine that just kind of depends on the band. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. I mean, it's like we're in a world now where like if Matt Starr cruises through with Ace Freely or Tyson cruises through with Vixen, um, you know, uh, or, you know, Tracy with Blake Shelton or, you know, Jim Riley. She knows all of us. She already knows them. (laughs) So, Rich, with that being said, the next time you guys play in Nashville, can I sit in on a song? (laughs) You know what? We're playing. We're doing a private corporate party at the Bridgestone and you can come and rattle some tambourine, buddy. Come on. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, man. I like tambourine. Tambourine's too hard, man. One of my favorite. Well, you know, what was that? What was this whole thing you had about the tambourine on your podcast recently? How it's the most difficult instrument on the stage. (laughs) It is. If you, you, because to do it well in the hands of, in the wrong hands, it sounds awful. There's a a mess you have to have. The tambourine is not as easy as you think. Yeah. In my opinion, mm-hmm. but yeah. boy, is it yeah. all, is it very? It, it's extra prevalent on like '60s records. It's so oh, yeah. loud in all the mixes and all those <laughs> records. <laughs> oh yeah, in Motown, it was louder than it's almost yeah. as loud as the vocal. You take that sucker out of there, it is not the same. You take you take the tambourine out of uh, "Eye of the Tiger" <laughs> by Survivor, it is not the same. Right. Um, 
and and uh, but no sarah was there like five feet from me thank god she recorded it but i was completely leather clad that night and i was playing the ten i was playing the cowbell part on don't fear the reaper with oh, Mr. Nice. cult and she's got video, video of it yeah, will ferrell over here oh i totally took the will ferrell part <laughs> nice and just lock quantized it so well th- we we got we owe a lot to tom hurst for being that outgoing affable wa- guy that created loud jams and the nashville drummer jams and you know he's got a team of people helping him and we you know we were going to do the thing monday night and then the weather got bad but right, it's just a right. great thing you know where we could celebrate all these b and c cuts of our favorite artists from all the decades that never got radio play maybe they did maybe they did not but you know i was going to do like some like it hot by the power station oh, nice. i love tony thompson god rest yeah, his soul absolutely. he was amazing that whole record is it's ridiculous sick record sick record so thank you tom for <laughs> for for being one of the models i think because he was doing that stuff before i even came up with my drummers weekend so tom sure. was on scene first yeah, I mean, he was doing the, like, the. I think the original was all jazz stuff, you know, fusion jazz and stuff like that, from what I uh, just, obviously, I wasn't here for it, but I, I've just heard the stories. Yeah, that was a stuff. smaller crowd. He's like, maybe I better add a backbeat here. Right. <laughs> we'll get more, we'll get more people in the building. Yeah, I mean, and it, it obviously worked. It's, yeah. you know, the Douglas Corner days were really, really formidable days for a lot of us, but I just remember, especially for me, like, I, and that was your fault because I was coming back from a gig uh, and I hadn't been at home for like a week. And I remember telling my wife at the time, was, she was, I was like, I, I, I'm going to be gone one more day. I got to go to this thing that Rich is telling me I've got to co- come, you know, be at. And had I not done that, I don't think, I, I, I don't, it's, I, it's, I try to tell people like, you have to go to these things because you never know that one person you'll meet. You know, I met Matt Farley that night who told me to go see the Rock and Roll Residency. So I went the next week, and that's how I got the big rock show gig. And that's and, and also in it, uh, inadvertently how I got the Vixen gig because a guy named Tony Higby saw me playing with the Residency guys and playing with the big rock show. And he, when Vixen needed a keyboard player. He called me. I was pulling out of Target, and I didn't even know the guy. I just remember seeing his name showing up on my phone. Like, let's see. Okay, oh, this is weird. But hello, <laughs> you yeah. Know? And hey, Cher from Vixen's looking for a keyboard player that can do tour managing duties. Do you think you can handle that? And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And then a month later, I was flying to Florida to audition, and both Brit Lightning, the guitar player, and I both got the gig at the same time. Because awesome. they were also auditioning guitar players. I hadn't seen Tony in forever, and I had to do like a triple take. But I ended up running into him at my friend Amy, Amy's Thanksgiving hang this year, and I was like, "Ah, oh, Tony! Oh my God! Yeah, we finally, <laughs> finally put it all together." You know, nice, crazy. Yeah, I mean, work. he got he got me the gig, but it, again, it was a vent. It was all, and that's what I try to tell people on this stuff. I'm like, you know, you got to show up to these things, and you got to be part of it, and you got to participate in it if you can because you never know that one person that'll see you or you might see somebody else you might go who's that guitar player i gotta get to know who that is yeah you know who's that drummer like i want to know i don't know but i love how he plays and make sure you just talk to him exchange numbers at the end of the song or whatever it is and yeah those are the things that get you from point a to point b um you know the cruises and stuff like you talked brought that up like that there's no better place to network than on a cruise ship because there's nowhere else to go and you're stuck <laughs> there for five days with these people and you see them in the cafeteria, you see them in the bathroom, you see them wherever. And it's like, oh, there's Steve Harris from Iron Maiden again. Hey, what's up? You know, it's those kinds of things, those moments that you kind of, and, and as you guys both know too, there's a fine line of like, all right, he's eating dinner right now. I'm not going to bother him right now, but I'll probably see him in a couple hours by the pool. Maybe that's the time to go say hi. You know, it's just trying to find that. When do you make that introduction, and then how do you do it, and all that kind of things. That so are these dudes networking. like you got you got Iron Maiden's band members? They're on the cruise ship for the five days, are and 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 the cruise is filled with rabid rock and roll fans. Yes, are they just walking among them? Like yeah, are they in Gen Pop. <laughs> They're just in general population. <laughs> they are um in fact a lot of times you know because they'll be back there watching other bands you know we're always going and supporting each other and that that's part of the fun about them too is like i was sitting there watching living color with the guys from la guns i was watching devo with those guys you know and getting to know and becoming closer friends with them and stuff and then 
at the end of the 80s cruise it's like me and la guns and living color all just hanging out together like i love both of those bands like love living color dreamly yeah Yeah. and so i mean like i said there's nowhere else to go let's just hang out in this lounge together until the sun comes up because what else are we gonna do (laughs) yeah i mean you did the kid rock cruise you did the kiss cruise you did the monster rock ship rocked this is a big thing it's a big uh it is the megadeth cruise one was insane to me because i'm a huge thrash metal fan um and david ellison the uh, former bass player for megadeth he put me in charge of the all-star jam of organizing the rehearsal and i just remember walking into this little lounge room it's called the bliss lounge and my entire childhood is sitting in this room. It's like Scott and Charlie from Anthrax here up there messing around with 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 Alex from Testament playing Steely Dan songs and guys <laughs> from Overkill and guys from Death Angel, like all these bands that I just love, like taught me how to play guitar. They're all sitting in the same room. I'm like, I have to be in charge of these people don't know me. How am I going to? So I just kind of did the Sylvester Stallone, just turned the head around. It's like, all right, so Scott, Charlie, you guys stay here. Bobby, you go to lunch because you're not here for another two hours. Just go find something to do and i just made the schedule put it together and i think that's why we became i've become friends with some of these guys is because i didn't buck at the idea of like okay here's my whole childhood so i just went straight to work and yes. I, and i did what i was there to do and the rehearsals were successful and the show was successful and they, we were playing and they a took, bunch of kiss songs it was a lot of fun nice. they took the uh they took your instruction and said all right cool yeah it's i mean a leader that yeah because i i mean i'm I'm sure first people are like who who the hell is this like but i tried to make sure i was like david david's had me kind of organize this stuff this is just something that i do back in nashville a lot so you know let's let let's get this organized so we can get you guys out of here at a reasonable time so oh they like that otherwise i think those were the magic words (laughs) yeah it's like you're hurting cats i mean musicians especially they need a leader they need somebody that's gonna you know it's gonna help organize things and keep things on time yeah man wow you know it's funny we get with artists in that genre like the heavier you know thrash metal hard rock heavy metal uh genre i've uh, my wife and i uh, will watch documentaries that feature some of these guys that she's never heard of she's always had like (laughs) not like an affinity for james hetfield she's like he just looks like a a positive, happy guy because he's always smiling. Right. <laughs> like I started thinking about you know guys like Tom Araya from Slayer. Yeah. When he's not on stage, he's always smiling, and I'm like, these guys are pretty just chill dudes. I'm like, you know, but I guess if I spent most of my adult professional life getting my my rage and anguish out, right, <laughs> be pretty chilled out too. <laughs> you know, so I, Rich. When Rich asked me about rescheduling my date uh, or my time i was like i want to make sure jim's on it because i know we can talk about some metal <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to make sure we had a day where you could be here too well, I yeah Jim, I mean, charlie, you- charlie benante is a yeah. uh, hero of mine from you know my childhood and drumming and i had a yeah, me too i had a pleasure to meet him uh at tuxedo junction in danbury connecticut i want to say he was out there playing a show with sod back in nice the- which I got to see that reunion run yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Those, uh, they're all hanging out on the balcony of, uh, right there, right. You know, very accessible, but you know, uh, not afraid of anybody who would came, who would walk up and I was walking with a buddy of mine who was <laughs> apprehensive about it. And I said, screw it. They're right there. Let's go say hello. Yeah. Said, oh, no, no. I'm like, come on, let's just do it. And I walk right up. I'm like, Hey, Charlie, he turns his head. I'm like, Real quick, man, you've been a huge influence to me. I appreciate everything you've done. He's like, yeah. oh, thanks, shook my hand, and that was it. You know, yeah. Just you know, don't try and overextend. Your but mind. you guys had Charlie on the show. I remember, yeah, you know, not too long ago. That was cool. Rich indulged me. He uh, <laughs> like he, he's like he he's he's appreciative of Charlie and all his efforts. But I mean, you know, Rich, sure. I, you didn't really have a, a a you weren't into the heavy stuff coming up. I so. was like, you know, I like Ronnie James Dio with Vinny right. Appice and uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I have my favorite metal outfits, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Charlie's been always, he's he, he, the first guys that I got to know in that band were, were Joey Belladonna. I worked with him on ship Rocked and played some stuff with him. Cool. And then, uh, Frank was there. The bass player was there with David Ellison too. Belly. So that's, I met all those guys on that ship and that's, that started a whole different, like, um, 
working relationship in the future with all those guys and um and, and friendships you know that permeated into then meeting scott and meeting charlie and meeting everybody else and stuff sure. like that. And i mean dude you're wearing monster. your own shirt rare hair that's right you, you said you wear created, your favorite shirt i, like, I mean okay. it's great font you created a brand and see that has to help yeah. things because good news travels fast and it you does. created something very positive that has become very successful that people actually look forward to and i think that can only help get your you know your name out there jim, jim and i had eddie trunk on i guess he's celebrating 40 years in broadcasting tell he us did. about that gig it was in vegas i was like oh my god so cool jim that was yeah. how actually how um tyson was going to try to connect us with um portnoy but um portnoy is uh they're kind of in no it's a lockdown moratorium on pr right now yes oh, okay. Uh, yeah, Mike and I became friends because of the um, cruise to the edge, which is the prog rock cruise that I and I'm be doing that this year as well. Wow. Uh, um, and it's funny because it's Mike and Eddie and me just hanging out the entire time because we didn't know. Oddly enough, I mean, it's not that we didn't know a lot of other people, but we kind of didn't. I certainly did not. Um, and Eddie, that was not really his wheelhouse. So he didn't know a lot of people, but he and Mike are real close friends. So we were just hanging the whole time. And, and so, um, so when the anniversary show came up, I called Eddie. Well, first he sent me an invite. I said, who, who's the MD on the show? He said, Portnoy and a guy named Brent Woods. I'm like, I'm calling those, I'm calling them right now. <laughs> so, um, I called Brent and uh, I texted them both and I said, Hey, I'm going to be there. I'm coming. I'm just there to hang. But if you got any, if you got spot for me, I'd be, I don't give a shit if I'm playing triangle, like I, throw me somewhere, I'll do something. <laughs> and uh, so I didn't hear anything at first. And then about two weeks before the gig, I just called Brent as I, I was in the pickup line, picking up my daughter at school. And I said, Hey, just reminding you, I'm going to be there. He's like, you are? I was like, I sent you a text like a month ago. And he's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's get you on here. Let me, I'll, let's definitely put you on kiss me deadly with Lita. Cause you've done it before. And then I'll call you back with the rest of the songs. Okay. Yeah. Lita, cool. yeah. Lita Ford, then, Brent Fitz. I love Brent. Yeah. And then, so then he calls me back or actually he just texts me a list of songs. Okay. These are Tyson songs. And I was like, school's out. No more Mr. Nice guy. And under my wheels with Alice Cooper. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. You're like what? Okay. I've seen Alice Cooper more live than any other artist ever. Oh. Um, he's, he's not my favorite artist ever, but he is my favorite live performer ever. Wow. That's saying a lot. I'm, I'm like going to school. I'm like taking notes, you know, and like, this is how you do a show, you know, even with simplexity, like the funk band, the go-go and I were in, we would go see Alice or we'd go see kiss. And the next time we'd come into a simplexity show at a club we'd be bringing pyro and we'd bring in all kinds of things that we saw from the show because it was just we you're always jazzed up about this is how you put on a cool show yeah and so to play with alice was that was a big deal dude that's and cool then, and then uh, the sammy hagar thing came along because <laughs> we were just at rehearsal and he was up there playing uh heavy metal on you know a guitar just singing by himself just kind of testing everything and he's like Where's Mike? And I'm like talking about Michael Anthony, and he's like, yeah, he's not going to be here for a couple hours. And he's like, who knows Pound Cake? And I'm like, I do. I played in a band for six years. <laughs> Grab a bass and let's go. I was oh, okay, cool. And we just there See, I am playing there, Pound there, Cake with Sam. There is a lot of value to you being the guy that can cover anything at any time on any instrument. Yeah, yeah that was it has wild. served you well, my friend. You know what I mean? And that's from 90 minutes. You know, we played that 90 minutes for six years and so that's i know that song inside out i can put in all the parts that's a great name so for all that all that cover work time cover music stuff yes it has definitely come in handy you know like roll with the changes i didn't have to practice that song i played that song a million times and yeah you know don't tell me you love me i played in a band here in nashville with a guy named brian gamboa called uh, hollywood boulevard and that was one of his songs in his in his wheelhouse in his in his set you know so when they called me up to play it um i was ready to go you know I had my sounds dialed up everything and all i had to do was program the sounds and get it to sound like the record you know and, and um one thing that i 
Chris Nix, who was part of the whole Loud Jams thing. Yes, Chris. The very people. first Loud Jams I ever did, after seeing the one that you invited me to come see, I met Tom and he's like, yeah, I'll just, yeah, we, I'll, I'll send you the list for the next show and then you can come be a part of it. And so he sent me the list and I was like, oh, I know about 18 of these songs out of the 30 songs or whatever. And he's like, oh, well, just play them all. I'm like, oh, crap. Okay. Um, so I meticulously just spent so much time programming, getting the sounds exactly as close to the record as possible and get everything. And the one thing that Chris had mentioned to me at that time is I really appreciate your attention to detail. There you go. And I still do that. Like, you know, when I'm playing with Alice Cooper, I'm like, okay, so I'm going through and finding karaoke versions of a song so I can really just get rid of the vocals, hone in on what's going on musically, what are the keyboards doing, what are the sounds and stuff like that that are happening, and then programming this board to sound as close as I can, including even just having like the, the school bell at the end. Like as soon as that last thing hits, I can hit that and there it is, you know, so. I, and and splitting the keyboard because like one thing that i noticed on that song is there's like there's there's like a synth and a thing going on and then there's an organ on the top right so and then um just honing in all the parts then that's so you, those so are the kinds of things it. that get you good jobs <laughs> yeah man well i i met i met brent woods doing all those uh bonham bashes bonzo yeah, bashes yeah. on the way yeah. great guy yeah. What were you going to say, Jim? Ah, that dude plays a lot and plays so well. He does. My brother and I, uh, as we've gotten older, have really cool conversations around music. And, you know, as I've become a producer in my own right, not for music, but for radio, I'll listen to, you know, songs on a walk. And, you know, you st when you start getting into multi-track producing uh, for a living, you start hearing the little nuances. Like, right. And, for example, Owner of a Lonely Heart, I never realized there was oh. a conga track. Uh, right. in the background and, and I was like oh my gosh I never I never realized that before but my brother and I talk about you know 1984 as an album right yeah and the brass that Eddie was able to get on I'll wait right was nobody has ever been able to replicate even the jump sound that synth sound yeah it's t it's it is it is a uh, tough one right challenging to find boards that are close um right I, I mean, I, I, in fact, for the Nashville's Drummer's Jam. Didn't I we play that one together, wait. buddy, me and you? Yeah. Yeah, we did and play All Wait together. <laughs> That's pretty close. It is. <laughs> But it's not exact, but it's right. really close. And know? I have to imagine that's happened in post production, a lot of that stuff. That's yeah, um, that very well could be true. Yeah. There's a so like right now when I play on Broadway, um, there's a there's a um, a guy out of Australia. He makes keyboard patches for keyboard players and for cover songs. And some of these are really really good. So um, like the jump one is actually. <laughs> And your pre chorus. But then on the chorus, what he did is pretty cool. Um, if I hold these note down here, you can hear that. You can hear that high uh -huh. octave string that kind of like creeps in there. And like, that's brilliant. And then um, you can't see the keyboard right now, but um, okay. we this hear is it, baby. a Yamaha MODX uh, series. And what What's cool about it is in one patch, there are four different buttons right down here where I'm pointing. Um, and so the first one is your verse. Second one is your chorus. And so you can do different sounds within the same patch of one sound. Gotcha. So then when I hit number four, there's my lead. And that's louder than the other one, so it stands out. So, but you still like, got to be able to break away to hit the patch setting, right? You do. And that, uh, yeah. So, like, when I'm doing a song like, uh, 
like I'm, ha- I'm having to do all kinds of different things <laughs> and change the patch sounds and stuff like that all at once. Um, one of the sound- songs we do every night is uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I play Kid Rocks on the rooftop um, from 10 to close. And we play pretty much, we, we play mostly the same set for the first hour and a half um, because it's just dance floor filler. Um, and it's the kind of stuff that keeps people there. And so we do take on me. And that one yeah. is a challenge because the spasmatics that, uh, set list here, man. Yeah, it's totally <laughs> um, the <clears throat> just the way that that song sits, though, like and the way that it's uh, mapped out on this keyboard, it, it it's a lot of button pushing and it's a lot of timing things just in the right spot. <laughs> it sounds like me and Jim, <laughs> uh, really a lot of button up. pushing. I'm always yes. pushing his button. <laughs> and there's your intro. What? That is your main sound. Right? And your verse. And your chorus. Right? And then your solo part. So it's all that. And then go back to the riff again, you know. So that's like one, two, three, four, five, six different button changes that I have to do within the same sound and or song. And I'm also singing it and playing it. <laughs> what a heyday for the keyboard player in the band. Like, give the keyboard player some. I mean, the new wave era. Right. We yeah, have never sure. been close since. <laughs> we really haven't. Yeah. I've never realized that song was so complex. There's a lot in that song. Right. What's going on? Never What's knew. going on? It's like going back to jump. Jump is uh, uh, on the surface a very you know seemingly elementary song, but from most guitar players I've heard, uh, it's one of the hardest solos that Eddie has ever recorded. In it's jump. a weird solo. Yeah, it's a and weird. Then, I suck at that solo. I would not do it. <laughs> and even the uh, the keyboard solo part, the drum part. The drum part gets really weird during that right. solo. It, it really does. does. And and it's, it's, boom, it's funny because I saw a version of them doing it live in 1984 85 and eddie and mike are both playing key like keyboard parts and eddie doesn't play a guitar solo at all he just yeah. plays the he plays the synth thing and then goes right into this keyboard solo it's it yeah. was really weird i was like whoa okay you were, yeah you were like 10 years old bro crazy yeah that it's was crazy <laughs> <laughs> It's really crazy. Well, that's terribly exciting. I'm so happy that you moved to Nashville because I think like sometimes just a change of location, going to the watering hole on the Serengeti where all the animals are drinking, they're all gathering and they're all part of a community has made a massive difference. I mean, you are connected with all of your childhood heroes now because I think you live in Nashville. When people say like, where do you live? Well, yeah, but it's your fault. (laughs) I uh, thank hey, God you, you came know, here. I've been preaching. To my I, I brother. took your advice. I listened to you. I've been telling my brother for you know probably a year and a half now. I'm like you know he he's really good at what he does, and he plays with all these guys in Detroit. He's in a, a Journey tribute band and a Bob Seger tribute band. Nice. And he's I'm like I said it's it's a problem when you're the best one in the room, dude. Yes, it is. I had 100. I hate. In fact, I always tell people uh, my my favorite scenario is when I'm the weakest link in a band like when i played in tracy lawrence's band i was like i was hanging on for dear life every night of my life i was like oh my god please don't suck today was it because you had to do the the the, the honky tonk um piano stuff or what yes but also because darren favorite is one of the most ridiculous guitar players i've ever heard you know and uh it was ben Gidry and tom i mean i was that that was an extraordinary band they're so good they are and i don't know i was just like I've never played any of this crap in my life. In fact, at the point when I got the gig, I hadn't even heard any of it. Cause you know, when Tracy was a, a big star and stuff like that, I was, 90s, listening yeah. to, I was listening to Alice in Chains and Tool and Pantera and uh, 311 and Sublime. I wasn't listening to country at the time. And so one thing about moving to Nashville that gave me an ex- a huge appreciation for the 90s era of country music and the musicians that played on those records and how great they are and i miss that <laughs> they really, they, 
they really are stretching a lot more than they are in the music now. I mean, now we've got the three chords and the hip hop beats and all that. But yeah. I mean, man, there was those, you know, the piccolo snare drums, train beats, everyone yeah. shredding on the guitar, the, you know, the keyboard pl the player, you know, filled on the second and, verse. That was the rule yeah, back in that. Yeah, had, I mean, you on. got Dan Huffs and, of the world and the, all those kind of guys. And, uh, you know, Brent Mason taking over the universe on guitar. And, and, and I went and saw Brent do his thing one night and I was like, yeah, okay. I, I know exactly why you have that job because all those guys, in fact, even the piano player who I can't remember who it was, I, I just, I watched them take a piece of crap, like a terrible song and turn it into a radio ready song instantly. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Because I'd heard it was in a songwriter's camp and it was it was just a very very mediocre okay i've clearly amateur have never written a song before song and they bring it to these guys and they map out the changes i watch them go to work i watch them write the charts and stuff and then first take i was like uh okay i guess that's radio ready already that's unreal and that made me realize that like as, as good a player as I am on keys and stuff like that, these guys, this is all they do day in and day out. Yeah. Like I, they may not be able to know 3000 some songs and play, you know, in bars like I do, but they have a skill set that is very, very unique. Formidable. You know, to what it's, it's a craftsman's town do. for sure. I mean, I, I wish I had kept a, there's some drummers that, you know, like the buddy Harmon, who was like the, you know, the, like a recording drummer in Nashville for at least 20 years. And, you know, then he was playing at the Grand Ole Opry as the house. He played on, you know, Patsy mm -hmm. Klein's Crazy and such. He, he said, I think he did 18,000, recorded 18,000 songs. I wish I had kept a running total because, you know, you're in Nashville <laughs> for 26 years. You're going to play a lot of songs. It's got to be tens of thousands. Sure. Of songs, but like know? most of the average that out, Rich. All the recording mm -hmm. stuff that I get is all from L.A. And, and Kansas City and other places. I've I've done a few things here, but not very much. Yeah, so I'd like to get more involved in that world too. It's even if it's not. I know I do realize the the hierarchy of how all that stuff works, and I, it makes sense to me. And I, there's a reason why you know the brent masons are where they are and do what they do but there are plenty of guys like chris condon and some of those guys that are putting out great material uh and that are you know making great hits for people i mean sure. uh, like grady saxman and, and the stuff what he did with dick Allen dallas is incredible i was like yeah that was a joke it was a something they were goofing off and now people are charging a hundred dollars to play it on broadway it's like good for them and good for yeah it's pretty cool. now what now what because i know grady sackman's saxman's name i know he's a craftsman i know he works all the time but yeah. I, he, he's not like out on the town because he's got a home studio you know what i mean right, so right. so yeah. what did i miss what happened there was like a song well, he, that he was uh that trey lewis kid had a song called dick down in dallas which is a very crass oh uh, a very very explicit song about a, a girl who, gotcha. or an ex-girlfriend who's going who's basically getting it on with everybody all over the country while you know it's it's that type of yeah joke and they wrote it as a it was kind of a, a joke and it was just something silly and it it just went viral and huge and it made you know it and now it was last year i would say last year within the last year and a half it was one of the most requested songs down on broadway but it was also one of those songs that is so explicit. I don't know what I can say and can't say on here, but um, that it made people charge a hundred dollars to play the song because they're like, ah, we're not, you know, we're not going to get or get fired for playing the song unless you pay us, <laughs> pay up for it or whatever. Really smart. So it became one of those extra songs next to free bird and some of the other ones that people charge a hundred bucks for so wow. thanks grady and, and trey and everybody <laughs> that w worked on that song because uh it, and it's a silly song but um people love it and it, and, it, and it's not just nashville i mean i went you know back to kc for people were asking for it there too and other places wow. so it, it became pretty big jim um, did you have a concept that you wanted to uh yeah, I was uh, thinking, going back to our discussions about Portnoy and, and those guys and your, you know, the circles that you keep in those areas and genres of music. Um, with the news, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard, but Rush, considering perhaps, you know, going back onto the road and hiring somebody. And it's like the timing is kind of interesting with 
And Jim's freezing from his closet. Jim's but, freezing. <laughs> yeah. What was the last part, Jim? You froze up a little bit in your studio. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, the timing of uh, you know Rush potentially going out on the road and yeah. Mangini all of a sudden being available. You think that's going to be uh, something that's uh, going to come to fruition? I mean, that would be a good choice, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd be a small list of guys that could do that yeah, thing. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say, especially with Mike being, did you say Mike? Were you talking about Mike? Mangini, yeah. Mike. Oh, Mangini. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. That'd be interesting. I don't, I don't, it's hard to say what they're going to do and yeah. how that will be received. I, I, in a way, in, for me, it's too soon. I, on, I'm like, I, but I also get the itch of being a musician and not wanting to sit around your house and like, I want to get out and still do some stuff. Yeah, it's um, been four years. But I mean, they, is it a thing where you hire somebody who can is, has got the pretty much the same setup and is going to do the thing right. drum to drum is going to do that exact choreography, or is it going to be a thing where you like? Well, I've always liked Stuart Copeland. Let's get Stuart Copeland to do his take on Neil's drum. Like, what would your it could be left of center? Or was thinking. it? Or is it even something completely different that's not called Rush? You know that that I mean, I think that was one of the biggest things with Pantera was that had they not call it pantera it would not be playing amphitheaters and arenas right but at the same time it's not pantera it's two guys that were it's the bass player and the singer you know what i mean it's like so yeah that that's where that argument is 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 weird um, well, it's like the foreigner thing it's right it's literally now is there is no original members unless mick comes out on stage for the one or two songs that he does it's right. a it's a brand and have i gone yes. to see the show oh yeah four or five times with four or five different drummers because i want to hear hot blood and cold as ice sure you know what i mean and exactly but what, what what do you think jim it's like they're all foreigners <laughs> hilarious ouch yeah. hold on get a I, I gotta i gotta find it hold i don't on. have a splash symbol near me but i have to get up walk across <laughs> the room <laughs> i'll do the uh there you go ah nice great timing I hit the guys China, not the splash <laughs> Ooh, nice that is a nice that is a nice splash buddy well it'll be interesting to see what happens with that you know uh yeah i don't know i don't you can't blame the guys for what, like you said, you know, getting stir crazy. This is what we've done ever since we were in our team. I mean, but don't call it. I don't. I think it's like don't call it rush and charge me three hundred dollars to come see it unless you're, you know, I don't know. That's, that's yeah, hard to you, say. It makes you kind of do this face as. Mm, yeah. yeah, like I mean, the Charlie Charlie's doing a great job with the Pantera Amazing. stuff. Yeah. It's still weird. I'm not gonna well, lie. Josh Freese is an obvious. Uh, you know, Josh Freese is such an obvious choice for right. that group of guys. I mean, they all probably yeah. live in this. You know, they live close to each other. Their kids probably will go to school together. They they're all around the same age. They mo most importantly, you know, of course, Josh can do the job. But I mean, they just get along personally you know what i mean so that, that's yeah. obvious so that's still the foo fighters, foo fighters right? is a little different though yeah. because like foo fighters it originally was just dave and yeah. he's had different players yeah. over and and they're all not household names right mm -hmm. that's the thing about the other bands like everybody knew diamond Vinny, everybody knew edward and you know eddie van halen and and um everybody knows neil pier like oh yeah mm -hmm. I think that's the difference. Gotcha. Whereas I only know a couple of the guys in the Foo Fighters by name, right? But everybody else are just like cool. <laughs> like I, it's it's like the '90s and the early 2000s. The rock stars were gone. I as I I, I couldn't tell you a single member of uh, a lot of those bands other than the singers. You know, better than Ezra. I know Kevin, but I only know his name is Kevin because of honestly because of living here yeah um you know jim blossoms same deal like i if they were all standing here in the same in the room with me i wouldn't even know that they were in that band isn't that crazy um, you you got you just you know the front man is it's the celebrated point of reference and it's the hardest first it's the i was talking to mike brignardella about it. i was like you know do i want to get out there i want to get out there and do something fun where i could play third and lindsley like four times a year making an event 
you know, have yeah. it sell out, be really enjoyable, handpick the material, be really happy with the other people that are on stage with me. But who's the front person? Who's going to be that charismatic guy that can carry the show that doesn't have lead singer disease? It's really, <laughs> Jim is holding up his hands like right here, me. It's a really hard thing to find. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta make the dad bod great again. Yeah. <laughs> he, he he tells he tells Chris Fryer from the Zach Brown band on the interview. <laughs> I really enjoyed you guys when you first came out because you were a breath of fresh air. All of you all had dad bods, like dads. <laughs> he agreed. That's fantastic. That's amazing. Well, Chris he agreed. Is, I mean, Chris is just so <laughs> like we did. So you're fun. not wrong. Yeah hilarious <clears throat> yeah but i mean i think that in the 90s started the whole anti-rock star thing you know and the, the grunge movement really put that into uh even though everybody does know who everybody in nirvana was you know but like most people can't name even like everybody in pearl jam or uh stp i mean i can because i mean i was a big fan but i would just say just as a whole you know as, a, as we the three of us grew up reading magazines and knowing who and Tommy Lee, Nikki Six, uh, Mick Mars, and Vince Neil means that's Motley Crue or whatever band, you know, name all kinds of different bands. And you can name every member of the band uh, because you're such a fan and you're reading the liner notes and the things of that nature that we did back then. And then come the 90s, you're like, wait, okay, I really like this song, but I have no idea who any of these people are. The and, 90s. Uh, it sonically. just continued that way. I mean, I remember driving around the New York state area, the tri-state area, listen, I was trying to get in the radio at the time and I would always listen to 92, three K rock and the mid nineties. Right. I was yeah. actually in a top 40 cover band at that time where we played the rage against the machine, smashing punk, right. all the stuff that was, you know, top 40 on the radio. That's what we covered. Um, but you're not wrong, man. I'm mean, to your point. It's, it is, and I, I correlate it to the sonic shifting that happened. There was cultural shifts that were happening at that time. And also there was a lot of, you know, record companies just thrown against the wall and seeing if it'll stick. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who else do you know in Maroon 5 or Fall Out Boy or right. whatever, you know, some of these Butthole bands. Surfers. <laughs> right. I mean, you remember the name. Yeah. Crash Test Dummy. What a great song that was. But what right. It Right. One hit, dude. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> also there's a correlation between, you know, the 60s. Uh, we, we bring this topic up a, lo a, a lot on this show is what artists are there out now? What songs that are going to be timeless that are being right. made right now? I don't, right. there's very few. Very few. Um, and I think it's because the lack, <clears throat> you know, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s, there was this thing called artist development. You know, right. if you didn't hit it on your first, second, or third album, well, you better hit it on your fourth or fifth. Right. Right now, it's like, well, you didn't hit your first album, you're out of here. You're, you're done. done. No artist development. You yeah. Know? No. yeah. I mean, that's, I think that's really luck. Time. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a Liam Neeson movie every time when you're, you know, good <laughs> luck. Um, so, Tyson, I, I'm just so happy you're in Nashville. I'm, I'm happy to call you a friend. I'm happy for all your success. I, you've got some goals for the future, which include, songwriting on a higher level and then doing some more recording uh sessions that we can hear on the radio which is you're in the perfect place for it is am i right in saying that those are some of your goals what's the you know what's, yeah, the, what's the next it is year? i what's mean i produced a, a country record for a guy named duke pendleton a few years ago and it's so good and it came out really like i, I love it i still love it i had no idea what to do with it it did absolutely nothing <laughs> but it's so good it's out there it's uh, yeah, a lot it's, you know it's it's um and that was my first kind of uh, voyeuring into that world and so i want to do more of that too i love working on new music with other artists um, there's a band called lost hearts that i uh, with a guy named kid named max fry who, who by the way you're talking about great eddie van halen uh copy guitar player he's in a van halen tribute band he plays nice. that role um but he's they've got their own original music that's really really good um in fact eddie trunk was kind of championing them on his show which is cool and so uh he and i have talked about doing some co-writing um there's an another young band like that called all or nothing uh that features a kid named brett carlisle who's currently also singing for the band great white but he also has his own original band from birmingham alabama called all or nothing and he just hit me up last night about doing a piano version of one of their songs, the singles that they just put out earlier this year. So 
you know, strip it down, just him, vo- his voice and piano and make it more of a ballad and see if we could do something with that. So, yeah, I, th- I, um, I think you'd be a great producer, man, because you have, you know, you cover all the bases on all the instruments. You know, you can relate to everybody yeah. harmonically, melodically. You could sing and, you know, you're a very hyper organized person. You're a nice person. That is covering all the bases for what a producer is. So I think that you should. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I finally connected with my favorite like songwriter of all time and who's become an uber producer uh, a guy named butch walker uh nice. last year and um that he kind of i don't know he's kind of the bar for me you know you as go. far as like how this how this works or what do you do and working with you know he's working with fallout boy and pink and avril lavigne and green day and all these huge bands and stuff like that but He's taken even back in the day, like in the in the uh, early two thousands, mid two thousands, working with Seven Dust and some of these other bands, and and taking these songs and making them into really great songs. And and I can always, well, at least then, not so much these days, but back then, I could always tell if Butch produced a record. You could yeah. just hear certain things. Well, he's and really like, smart. That he's he is an artist in his own right. And he yeah. is a producer and he is a songwriter all of all at the highest level. So he's checking everything. He's covering art and commerce. You know, he's satisfying yeah. his soul. And then he's like, all right, I'm going to do this pink record and I'm going to make a lot of money doing it. You know, yeah. elevates it to so high goals. art. <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> so to speak, you know, that's it's his songs on there. I mean, it's really, really smart. OK, we're going to do the the favorite five and you can answer these oh, relatively yeah. quickly. Favorite color. Black. I mean, dude, you, I love it. Yes. If you look back there, my whole t shirt collection is 95% black. Yeah, me too, brother. Yeah, people are like, where do you get all your crisp black tees? And I gave them about five brands, and they're like, all right, thanks, man. Favorite drink? Mm, Red Bull. <laughs> Keeps yeah. me going. Vodka? Okay. Nah. Just no alcohol it. for me. I'm allergic to alcohol. You are? What a lucky man. I love that. How about <laughs> it's food? It definitely helped food it could be a it could uh, be a pretty much anything italian yeah uh, really yeah yeah oh, do you, do you make some of it i'm the worst asian ever i didn't even have vietnamese food <laughs> until I, I i moved until tony tony uh nagy nagy took me to a pho place down the street from after a loud jams one time or before oh and that was the first time at 40 years old having vietnamese food in my whole life and i'm vietnamese because <laughs> i was going to ask you if you had some you know some some of the cultural roots there that kind of not none whatsoever i because of i was raised by white people so i'm very white people in, so you're like internally. here's your noodles with ketchup good <laughs> yeah, yeah, i hope, I hope you enjoy that tony nagy <laughs> First bass player I ever played with in Nashville in Paul nice. Ross and the Cadillacs. We were wearing our monk, our monkey suits and making our 150 reading YMCA <laughs> charted That's out. Awesome. The baseline charted out completely I love it. I love charted it. out. Yeah. Um, okay. Favorite song. That's hard. A lot of people are like, dude, is there one song that you hear on the radio? It's your favorite. No matter where it's in, you're going to listen to the rest of that thing. Yeah. My answer to that is always, it depends on the day. There you go. Um, that, that. that that changes every day um, because one day I wake up and I'm like, oh, man, I really feel like listening to Dwight Yoakam today. And then and then I, have, I find that one song that, you know, his version of Little Sister or whatever is like, man, I love this song. Um, and then the next day I'm like, okay, it's raining blood by Slayer, you know. Or the next day, it's <laughs> or the next day, it's you know, don't worry, be, you know. But yeah, I don't know, whatever. It's literally different every day. And, and it, I, is it, it, what is it? What is it today? Um, gosh, I haven't been awake long enough. <laughs> <laughs> I realize it's like seven o'clock almost, but I didn't even get up until like one one thirty today, do and then keep, I have not done anything. Oh, do you keep musician hours? Are you a, a, a night owl? Uh, very much so. Yeah, I mean, in fact. But so see, you drop you pick your kids up from school. You don't drop them off. Uh, I do know. So my day to day is, um, you know, like a Sunday night, getting home from the gig, then get up Monday at seven a.m. Take Luna to school, come home, take a nap, and get up about one one. Go pick her up from school. Uh, find something to do for about an hour. Go pick up Nelson from school, and then find you know take them to all their activities their gymnastics and basketball and chess and choir and all of the things and then at seven o'clock mom gets them and i go off to work and that's wow that's pretty much every day wow man <laughs> incredible um and uh favorite movie favorite movie goodfellas nice little ray liotta action there man i i i never get tired of that every, every time and the, the only bad thing about goodfellas is when it's on randomly like somewhere and 
I just feel like I have to stop everything that I'm doing to watch this two and a half hour movie. I'm like, damn it, I have other things I should be doing right now, but What's I cannot so funny stop about watching this. me. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's the same thing Wait, for me with you know, Ridley Scott's Alien. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch yeah. it all the way through. What about you, Jim? <laughs> what's your what's your movie that you gotta watch if it's on? Oh gosh. I mean, aside from the obvious Marvel stuff. Yeah. Jim loves the Marvel universe. I do too. I, I've got a lot of catching up to do on that though right now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Infinity War is certainly one of them. <laughs> uh, but I guess, you know, Close Encounters, Jaws, those types of Oh, wow. Of oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, can you just imagine how different the, that movie would have turned out if the shark had actually worked? <laughs> you know what I mean? It could have been very, very cheesy with this mechanical chart, but the fact that it was nine times I, out I of I thought 10, you were calling into question it's actually the character's work ethic. Yeah. Well, I'm the like, music, hey, though, too, like yeah, just yeah. two notes. Yeah, it's um, just like that's how brilliant it is. I mean, like, <laughs> that's, that's when I was a kid um, and Everything. through college and high school, I wanted to actually score films for a living. That's what I wanted to do. I was a, I'm, I, my my soundtrack score collection is very yes. very deep. Yeah, and um, and, and it's obvious the John Williams and the and and all the the big ones, but also like some of the lesser known guys, like the you know I, I've got it all, and I just that's probably a, a result of me being a big fan of classical music and sure. having grown up, you know, playing this stuff. I mean, that's how I won that contest. You know, Good for you, man. The guitar I was playing. You know, I'm playing that kind of stuff. So I still love all that stuff. That's what I mean by it changes every day. Some days I'll be in my car. I, I remember being in my car one day and my friend's like, every time I get in your car, it's like being in a movie. I'm like, because I'm listening to movie soundtracks a lot and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I listen to pretty mellow stuff most of the time or podcasts or <laughs> interview, uh, or books on, on tape. Uh, in my car as a I'm, I'm always listening to soundtracks too man like you know there's there was a movie called um sinister that had one heck of a of a scary soundtrack and then i love jerry goldsmith because he did the alien soundtrack jerry but goldsmith, he also did he also did planet of the apes and it's heavy yeah. heavy, heavy heavy percussion oh who's that behind you there's a oh, human being behind you. luna oh there's luna hi uh, this is luna hi how are you, are you? Say hi to our audience. This is Luna. Um, that's awesome. So, are you guys gonna have some spaghetti tonight? Are you guys are you having the noodles and, and and ketchup tonight? I don't know. We have. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. You want some spaghetti for for dinner? Yes. Okay. I love it. I love it. Tyson, what is the best way for people to contact you? You got a dot com? Are you a Facebook guy? You you like people to slide into your DMs? What's the deal? everything's easy to find for me um, yeah. just googling my name my first and last name tyson leslie it's all there i mean uh i i'm one of those people that gets on on platforms really early when they come out even if it's something that i don't think will be successful or whatever i'll just sign up for it just in case because you never know when so I, I remember signing up for facebook when it was just a college thing you know and my friend turned yeah. me on to it and it was only for college kids and stuff yeah. and i'm glad i did it when i did because you know that that way i've got my name yeah it's just it's easy to find me. Me all too. The time. As soon as that thing opened itself up to the public, I think it was 2007. I got on that sucker, man. And I just joined TikTok. <laughs> Jim has been encouraging me for years. And it's really humbling because I am starting slowly and organically. I've I been watching your stuff on there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dude, I, I did the same. Like, I've been really slow about it. And then all of a sudden, I've had people go, I've been seeing you post a lot more on there. I'm like, well, because A, I'm going through one. Th one <laughs> When you go through going through a divorce and stuff like that, I it, for whatever reason it's freed up some time for me to do stupid things like that, yeah. uh, and and for working on that. But man, as you know, as anybody else in our industry knows, like last night I was spending hours just making thumbnail pictures for YouTube stuff. You know, like the 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 time that is consumed by doing all of the social media stuff is ridiculous i know and, and that's not even has having anything to do with the music part of it i know it's all the and it's yeah can you imagine <laughs> when we go to jim jim jim's always like you know you got a content's king we got to create contact we got to could you imagine we're on our deathbed we're meeting our maker and he's like you know all that time you spend creating content it was 
<laughs> ah, I shouldn't have done that. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's just sometimes I'm thinking like, geez, this is very time consuming. But, <laughs> but anyways, this was not time consuming. This bl- breezed by, my friend. I am so happy you joined us. It did, but we... I don't know. I don't even know how long we've been talking, but it oh, seems man, longer than the hour that you, you probably can do a lot of editing. <laughs> oh, there's no editing, man. It's root warts and all, man. We've been at it for like over 90 minutes. Incredible. Like your band. Love it. Jim, any yeah. last questions for our Tyson Leslie here today? Oh, I mean, what did you learn? Let's go back to that question. What did I learn? What did today? I learn? Or what did you learn? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I learned. I learned that uh, I'm you're never out enough pressing the flesh, and I have never gone to a rock and roll residency show. I need to get out and see a rock and roll. I need to make sure that I I'm they out just there. did one like a couple days ago. I know. I saw that, and I was like, "Where were you? You weren't there." And then I need to go and do the rare hairs, and I need to uh, just get out and be and do something social with you, man. It's been like probably like four years since we had lunch at uh, Calypso Cafe. It has. And because right when you moved to while. town, I started going to L.A. on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And so now that I'm not doing right. that as much, I think it'd be a great time. But for one us of the connect. things, I mean, I think I men- mentioned this on the last podcast. You're talking about that, though. When I was new to town and, and I saw you, one of the things that I did to kind of try to up my networking a little bit better was I went to lunch with somebody every day for like two or three months, nice. Monday through Friday, somebody different every day. And that was just so I could kind of figure out who's who and get to know them as humans, as opposed to just faceless drummers or, or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and that, that was, that was pretty, uh, that, that helped me a lot to kind of get to know who my circle of people are and friends Love are. And, Never and, eat and alone. Them are still my, um, you know, some of obviously I'm talking with you down, but guys like Tony or in like, you know, Matt, Matt Billingsley and, and some of these guys that were yeah. side guys, they're all they're still my friends, you know, and that's a, because of loud jams again, going back to that same thing. And it's yeah. because of that hanging out at Chris Nix's house all afternoon, rehearsing and getting to know people that that part I miss. I miss yeah. that part about all of these jams is the, just the hang, that, yeah. you know, that, and now everybody's too damn busy and they don't, yeah. <laughs> they don't want to show up to that stuff anymore. We're going to get out. Jim, what'd you learn, man? You know, I learned that uh, take on me is a lot more complex than I realized. <laughs> and also that uh, Tyson is a good hang and we got to do it in person. Yeah, we'll yeah, definitely totally let's do it. Let's do it, man. Well, Tyson, thank you so much for your time and talent. Jim, as always, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com. Everybody reach out to Tyson on the web. And then, hey, you know, throw me a bone here. I took a year to write this book, Making It yeah. in Country Music, an insider's look at the industry. It's available from Jeff Bezos. So deliver it to your front door. You can download it to your Kindle <laughs> or your iPad. And then if you're a fan of the show, spread the word. Subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And uh, thanks again, Tyson. And to all the listeners, thank you so much. Jim, yep. thank you so thanks much. We'll see you guys me. next time. Thanks, Tyson. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com forward slash podcasts.